Hey, this is Brett. Welcome back to Brett and Some Books. Uh, today we're continuing The First Casualty by Philip Knightley. This is Chapter 7, The Remedy for Bolshevism is Bullets, 1917-1919. to If we are in the end forced to go, we shall slam the door behind us in such a way that the echo shall be felt throughout the world. Leon Trotsky no matter what one thinks of Bolshevism, it is undeniable that the Russian Revolution is one of the great events of human history, and the rise of the Bolsheviki a phenomenon of worldwide importance, just as historians search the records for the minutest details of the story of the Paris Commune, so will they want to know what happened in Petrograd in November 1917, the spirit which animated the people and how the leaders looked, talked, and acted in this struggle. My sympathies were not neutral, but in telling the story of those great days, I have tried to see events with the eyes of a conscientious reporter interested in setting down the truth. John Reed in Ten Days That Shook the World. The Russian Revolution and the subsequent Allied intervention to try to overthrow the Bolsheviks a campaign that established a pattern for the relations that have existed between the Soviet Union and the West ever since, um, at the time of printing in 1975, must rank, us as, must rank as two of the major events in this century's history. Yet, if the public was not kept informed as to what was happening in Russia with those momentous days in 1917, nor the intervention and progress of the Allied forces in 1918 and 19. In both matters, correspondence in Russia, with three exceptions, failed lamentably to meet the challenge. Most of them, in common with their editors, had no idea what, Bol what Bolshevism was and had no intention of learning. The few who did realized the impact that the revolution would have on world affairs and who took to a line different from that of their governments were silenced by the censor or by some other authority. The others made little effort to see beyond what they were told to see. They accepted uh, as fact not only the propaganda of their own governments but also the obviously suspect reports of the Tsarist agencies in exile. One journalist, Harold Williams, who was in southern Russia for the Times of London and the New York Times, and therefore a correspondent of immense influence, was so personally involved with the anti-Bolshevist forces that he should never have been given the assignment. Others translated wishful thinking into fact. The New York Times, in the two years from November 1917 to November 1919, reported no fewer than 91 times that the Bolsheviks were about to fall, or indeed had already fallen. And when, despite the reservations of President Wilson, the Allies went ahead with intervention, at first to, quote, stop the Germans walking through Russia, end quote, and then, after the war, to, quote, stop the red peril, end quote, the correspondents reported either grossly exaggerated successes or nothing at all. Yet, what a story awaited their telling. 300,000 Allied soldiers marched into Russia to fight the Germans and to stay and to fight the Red Army. There were Frenchmen, Britons, Americans, and Italians. There were Canadians, Australians, and Japanese. There were Balts, Poles, Greeks, and Finns. And there were Czechs, Slavics, Estonians, and Latvians. They drew a ring around Moscow and Petrograd that threatened to strangle the Russian Revolution in its infancy. And their actions, coupled with the Allied economic blockade, increased Russian casualties from famine, disease, and civil war to close to 14 million. Then the war against Germany ended. The months passed, and when the Allied governments kept their soldiers fighting in Russia for a cause they neither understood nor believed in, 
The soldiers mutinied. The French, come on. The French, the Americans, the Canadians, and the British all mutinied. Some shot their officers and surrendered to Bolsheviks. Some raised red flags, sang revolutionary songs, and refused to obey orders. So little of all this appeared in print that not only was the newspaper reader at the time kept in ignorance of the role of his countrymen were playing in the intervention, but a student today can find little reference in his country's history books. What can only be described as a conspiracy in which war correspondents were major participants kept from public scrutiny events that Russia... Uh, in Russia that were unfavorable to the Allies. A few correspondents refused to keep quiet, but in general the Russian Revolution posed a challenge that <clears throat> they were unable to meet at a time when the objective when objective reporting was vital and could even have influenced the course of history their contribution to public knowledge on this matter of world importance was, to quote Walter Lippmann, about as useful as that of an astrologer or an alchemist. When Russia went to war against Germany in 1914, it was without any foreboding of disaster. The army, as it creaked into mobilization, was the largest in the world. The peasants and workers, inspired by emotional love of Mother Russia and the chance to eat regularly, responded willingly to the first call-up, only to find they were led by a minister for her war had not read of for a minister for war who had not read a military manual in twenty five years. Many were sent to the trenches without boots, without proper clothing, and sometimes without even rifles. A front of ten miles would have one machine gun. Batteries of six-inch guns would be supplied with four-inch shells. The tactics of the czarist officers were to send their troops against the Germans in wave after wave, in the hope that what could be won uh, by no other way could be won by sheer weight of numbers. Russian casualties were unbelievable, even by First World War standards. The garrison regiment in Kiev, the 165th, consisting of about 4,000 men, had such a high casualty rate that 36,000 replacements passed through it in one year. Hindenburg, the German commander, estimated that total Russian casualties at 5 million to 8 million, and he complained about a new military problem, how to use machine guns when the field of fire was blocked by mounds of Russian corpses. By late in 1916, when 15 million Russians had been mobilized, the army was reeling before the Germans on the 1,000-mile northern front and struggling desperately with the Turks in the Caucasus. The industrial and transport system could no longer cope with an army as large as this, and the Allied landing at Gallipoli, designed to both ease the pressure and open a route through the Black Sea, for food and supplies had failed miserably. The Allies found themselves facing this bitter prospect that Russia was losing her will to fight. Little of this background to the Russian Revolution found its way into the Allied press. Following their initial victories, the Russians refused to allow war correspondence at the front, except for occasional conducted tours after a battle had been fought in such a decisive engagement as the Battle of Tannenberg in August 1914 was not reported at all at the time and received only incomplete mention in 1915 and was not fully reported until after the war. There was, however, one British war correspondent who managed to get to the Russian front and stay there for two years, and yet who although he saw a lot of this, did not report it. Robert Liddell, representing the illustrated weekly The Sphere, made his way to the Polish front as a member of the Red Cross. Once there, he overcame the ban on war correspondence by re persuading the 165th Regiment to make him an honorary officer, <clears throat> 
not too difficult for a Russian-speaking Englishman with good connections to arrange. He got his dispatches and his photographs, taken with a four-pound Kodak camera, back to London uncensored by the simple expedient of attaching ten rubles to each packet he submitted to the Russian censor. Liddell has said he witnessed the terrible state of the Russian army and its unbelievable casualty rate, but I didn't write about it. My position was rather irregular, so I was careful not to write anything that was too controversial. Liddell was not alone. All the western, the major western newspapers and press agencies had residence in correspondence in Petrograd, but with very few exceptions that they wrote bore little but with the very few exceptions what they wrote bore little relation to what was actually occurring there were two important reasons for this the first was that the alliance with russia was an embarrassment for the allies in the propaganda field challenging the basic ideals for which they claimed the war was being fought if this was a war between the forces of good and evil between light and dark, between democracy and absolutism, then what were the Allies doing fighting alongside Imperial Russia, a byword for the ruthlessness and cruelty of its tyrants? It was obvious, therefore, that dispatches dealing with the corruption, muddle, and incompetence of the Russian army would not find space in the Allied press, and that the shortcomings of the Russian autocracy would remain an undisclosed subject until the end of the war. Moreover, the majority of the foreign co correspondents in Petrograd were British or French, and most of them thought the Russian military machine was running down and mighty, might actually stop was too painful to contemplate. If the Russians stopped fighting, the German divisions on the Eastern Front could be switched to Flanders, and the whole might of a united German army could roll across France to the Channel, and perhaps beyond. So, while the evidence that Russia was reaching the end of her military uh, resources mounted daily, British and French newspapers, with the exception of the Manchester Guardian, towed the official line, Russia could carry the war indefinitely. Credit for the Guardians having been the only newspaper to realize and to print the truth belongs largely to the British war correspondent to emerge from this period, Morgan Phillips Price. The Price family had been in Gloucester timber trade since the, ninth, the 18th century and in the 1850s had started to import timber from Russia. Phillips Price... Having learned Russian, went to Siberia in 1910 on a scientific expedition and generally interested himself in Russian affairs. When the war began, he was appalled at the, allegiance, at the alliance with Russia. C.P. Scott, the Guardian's ed great editor, took the, time, took the same view and since any information about what was happening in wartime Russia was scarce, he decided in the winter of 1914 to send Phillips Price there. His brief was not only to send uh, dispatches, but also to keep Scott privately informed so as to help him formulate the newspaper's policy. Perhaps uh, Phillips Price stayed on and saw the war and the revolution and the start of the subsequent Allied intervention, and with the American John Reed stands head and shoulders above any war correspondence of the time. The blame for, British, for Britain's state of public ignorance about Russia must rest largely with the Times, whose correspondence in Petrograd was Robert Wilton, a man of nearly fifty who had been in Russia from an early age and who, before joining the Times, had, 14, had for fourteen years been a correspondent for the New York Herald, Wilton, whose son was serving in a Russian regiment, had visited the front early in the war, but was now concentrating on political news. On November 16, 
1916, Wilton took a hard look at what was happening in Petrograd and then wrote to Wickhamsteed, the foreign editor of the Times, in some alarm. The dynasty was in peril, Wilton said, and the morale of the people low. Blundering had marked every act of the Russian ministers since the war started, and in a country teeming with food, we are bereft of the most elementary necessities of life. Not only did the Times completely ignore the message from its own correspondent, but on December 11th, it carried a leading article based on Reuters' message headed, Russia Firm and United. On December 29th, Rasputin was murdered. The Times carried nothing beyond the bare facts of the murder. Wilton cabled the details, the background, and assessment of the murderer's probable effect on Russian affairs. But, as the Time later admitted, the editor, influenced to some degree by a hint of the Foreign Office, decided that the details, though a lurid interest, were not fit for columns of the Times. In some desperation, Wilton wrote to Steed on January 19, 1917, pleading with him to recognize how serious the situation in Russia was. Things are in an appalling state. Chaos has poisoned all lower branches of the administrations. I hear from all sides that there is a plot to get rid of the emperor and empress. The letter reached the Times by the end of January, two months before the March Revolution, overthrew the Tsar and ended the monarchy in Russia forever. The Times ignored it. Its Russian expert, Sir Donald Mackenzie Wallace, had retired, and there was no one in Printing House Square who was informed about the Russian situation adequately to propound or carry out a Russian policy. Might not the Times have taken its own correspondent's word for what was happening, or have consulted experts? After the war, the Times excused itself on these two counts by saying that Wilton did not command full confidence, and that the newspaper's foreign department was too exhausted by routine to inspire articles on a disaster which his correspondent predicted. It is not until Lord Milner, then Minister Without Portfolio, and later Secretary for War, came back from Russia on March 3rd after arranging for the Russians to receive supplies of munitions and encourage them to fight on, that the Times realized Wilton had been right. Milner saw the editor two days after his return and warned, warned him of impending trouble, but before the Times could correct the impression resulting from its failure to report the situation in Russia, the March Revolution occurred. Beginning with a series of strikes, the revolution spread rapidly. By March 15th, a provisional government was formed and the Tsar abdicated. All this happened completely unexpectedly and without any coordination. To his extreme annoyance, it interrupted the British ambassador, Sir George Buchanan, on holiday. The confusion provides a small measure of of excuse for those correspondents on the spot who failed to report what was going on. On the night of March 12th, the telegraph office in Petrograd closed down, so British newspapers received no reports of what was happening until three days later. The foreign office, however, remained fully informed, but decided to release no news to the British press until matters became clearer. Then, overnight, on March 15th to 16th, 18 telegrams from Wilton poured into the Times office. He was able to describe vividly all of what was happening because the Times Petrograd office was alongside the prefecture, where all the Tsar's ministers had taken shelter. On rough computation, four-fifths of the city is in the hands of the troops who have gone over to the Duma, Parliament. Moreover, a huge number of inhabitants are armed with rifles, revolvers, and swords. There is still a good deal of casual firing, but on whole the armed crowds behave well. They successively stormed and gutted all the police stations, carefully destroying all papers and releasing prisoners. Wilton's political comment on one telegram 
showed that he realized the power had passed from autocracy, but he saw no danger of the commune, and he hoped that the new Russia would prosecute the war with unparalleled vigor. The Times backed him, warning that a democratic republic in Russia in present conditions would inevitably result in disruption, wholesale bloodshed, and ultimately in reaction. The March Revolution occurred while Philip's Price was in Tiflis, and the Caucasus, where Grand Duke Nicholas, the Tsar's uncle, was viceroy. A few hours after news of the Tsar's abdication was received, the Grand Duke summoned Philip's Price to an audience and to receive an important communication. Philip's Price found the Grand Duke looking haggard. His eyes were red and his cheeks pale. He had clearly not slept for several nights. I want to tell you, he said to Philip's Price, that what has happened in Russia is the last twenty-four hours in final and cannot be reversed. I would regard anyone who tries to do so as an enemy of our fatherland. Clearly, the duke thought that the chances of restoring the Romanov dynasty were hopeless, and the Philip's Price telegraphed a message to the Manchester Guardian on these lines, quoting the Duke in full. The dispatch appeared in the Guardian six days later, but in one edition only. The reason for this remains unknown, but Phillips Price believed that his dispatch somehow got past the censor, and after it had appeared in the first edition of the paper, the censor must have ordered it to be deleted. The Americans were openly jubilant about the overthrow of Imperial Russia, the Secretary of State, Robert E. Lansing, said the revolution had removed the one objection to affirming that the battle was between democracy and absolutism. America could now go to war alongside Russia with a clear conscience. President Wilson was lyrical. The great, generous forces that are fighting for freedom in the world, for justice and peace. In many circles, in Britain, there was equal enthusiasm. The Manchester Guardian said the sympathy of every man in this country will go out to the Russian people in this supreme hour, and deplored the tendency in other newspapers to take sides over the future government of Russia. What no one wanted to doubt at this stage was that new Russia would continue to prosecute the war. The way the New York Times handled the news best expressed the desperate wish to believe that Russia would not leave the Allies. In its issue of March 16th, it published on the front page a paragraph from London saying, As the situation is explained to the New York Times correspondent, the revolution simply means that German sympathizers in the Russian government have been overthrown and that no chance remains for a separate peace being secretly arranged with Germany. But the same issue is buried at the foot of the fifth column on page four in an interview with Leon Trotsky, who was then in New York. The cause of the revolution, said Trotsky, was the unrest of the mass of people who were tired of war, and the real object was to end the war throughout Europe. Evidence that Trotsky was right was not long in appearing. Prince Phillips gave the first indication of real feeling in Russia against the war. In Moscow, he interviewed the new foreign minister, Emilyukov, who took the Allied line and said bluntly that nothing would satisfy his new government but the end of the Austrian and Turkish empires and Russian annexation of Constantinople. This interview was published in the Manchester Guardian on April 26th and was then telegraphed back to Russia where it caused a sensation. Factory workers and soldiers paraded in the streets with banners proclaiming, Donath Milyukov, long live peace between workers of all lands. And a few days later, Milyukov was forced to resign. In April came Lenin's historic journey across Germany from exile. Transported, Churchill wrote later, and a sealed truck like Plaque Bacillus from Switzerland into Russia. Few correspondents bothered to report Lenin's arrival. Wilton was visiting the Northern Front, and so the Times had to carry, on April 20th, 
a report on Lenin's passage based on a Reuters telegram. Ten days later, on the basis of information in the telegram from Reuters, it reported a demonstration in Petrograd at which workmen carried banners demanding that Lenin should get back to William. <clears throat> Lenin had made little impression at first, and the Allies remained convinced, against the growing weight of evidence, that Russia could be persuaded actively to continue the war. They embarked on a campaign of propaganda to promote this. They set up press departments in their embassies in Petrograd and asked correspondents to write articles saying that the Russians were eager for a further offensive against Germany. Phillips Price refused to do so and told the British embassy official who came to see him that his own evidence was that the Russian army was in no condition to fight and would begin to melt away with the approach of winter. He reported these views to Scott, the Guardian's editor, who went to London once a week to see the Prime Minister, Lloyd George. Philip Price's views were so different from those of the government was receiving that the Foreign Office suggested to Scott that he reassure himself about Philip Price's reliability by sending out another correspondent. Scott sent David Sluskisi a British subject of Russian immigrant stock who compromised, who, yeah, his professional objectivity immediately by becoming secretary to the future Prime Minister, Alexander Kerensky. Okay. In July, the Russian army began a major offensive on the southern front and for a while drove the Austrians back, but the Austrians counterattacked and the Russians collapsed. By August, the great garrison towns in Galicia were in uproar, in confusion as a million Russian soldiers deserted and started for home. The Allies simply refused to believe this. In Britain, a photograph showing Russian troops packed into, onto the roofs of railway carriages on their way back to the villages was published in the Daily Mirror under the heading, Russian Troops Hasten to the Front. In the United States, the New York Times published a series of dispatches in the first three weeks of August that were, to say the least, decidedly optimistic. The headlines varied from Russians throw Germans back to Russians repulse attacks everywhere. But the theme was the same. The Russians were winning. Unfortunately, this was completely untrue. Even Harold Williams, a freelance journalist who wrote for the New Europe and other newspapers, and who later, as the Times representative, was to emerge as by far the worst correspondent, war correspondent in Russia, saw the Galician operation as a shameful collapse, an hour of national disgrace. By now, the Russian Prime Minister, Kerensky, had begun to lose control, and it was clear that unless the Allies did something drastic, Russia would soon be out of the war for good. Then, for light relief, there, there arrived on the Russian scene one of those larger-than-life Englishmen, who was to establish the precedent for British intervention in Russian affairs. He was the forerunner of scores of adventurers, spies, and soldiers of fortune who were to appear in Russia in the next few years. His name was Oliver Stiflingfleet, Stillingfleet, Locker Lampson, and he was a member of Parliament. His family, which was descended from Oliver Cromwell, lived at Rofin, Sussex for more than four centuries. The family had its own private railway station and the right to stop at a certain number of trains each day so that the Locker Lampsons could get on or off. Oliver Locker Lampson had gone to Russia with a British armored, squad, armored car squadron which had been sent as a gesture of allied solidarity in the fight against Germany and had been wounded. This eccentric but admittedly brave man, involved himself in political intrigues from the moment he arrived in the country, even to the extent of, so he claimed, 
being invited to help murder Rasputin. It was not surprising, therefore, that the commander-in-chief of the Russian army, a tough Cossack named Lavor Konolov, strongly urged Locker Lampson to help him stage counter-revolution. Locker Lampson agreed, and plans were finalized. The British ambassador, Sir George Buchanan, knew about the plot, did nothing to stop it, and got himself well out of the way by arranging to spend the day on the British resident's golf course. But the coup went wrong. Kerensky armed the Petrograd workmen and ordered Kornilov to resign his command. By the afternoon of September 11th, the counter-revolution was all over and Kornilov was in flight. Locker Lampson had to take his squadron straight to Archangel, where it was shipped back to Britain. The result of the whole comic mess was that Britain, thanks to Locker Lampson, was hopelessly comprised in Bolshevik eyes two months before the October Revolution. The Times regretted the failure of the coup. Oh, Nadia, you stinker. All right. You always have to make an entrance, don't you, baby? The Times regretted the coup, the failure of the coup, and the Petrograd Society of Journalists wrote an open letter to the Union of English Journalists complaining about the bias in Wilton's reports. The Times also attacked by the Manchester Guardian for its general attitude to Russia. The Guardian arguing that, although the Times might be regarded abroad as the semi-official organ of the Foreign Office, it had no right to criticize these British papers that did not want to see the new government in Russia overthrown. The follies were to multiply. Correspondents had found the demands of reporting what occurred in Russia up to October 17th beyond them. The Bolshevik Revolution uh, uh, now overwhelmed them. Unable to comprehend what was happening, and at a loss to explain the strength of Bolshevism and ignorant of the forces of the extreme left, most correspondents simply gave up. Looking back at its own coverage of American of Russian Revolution, 35 years later, the Times admitted its shortcomings. The idea of a campaign ad noirum proletarius glorium was so foreign to Wilton that he never understood it, most unfortunately still, the idea was equally foreign to Steed, Dawson, Northcliffe, to Lord Lloyd George. You are a diva, Nadia. All right. And to Milner. No one had had the forces of the left except in terms that indicated them to be madmen. This explains why the rise of the Bolsheviks was not reported and why their sudden arrival in the corridors of power left most correspondents and hence their readers bewildered. Harold Williams had an inkling of what was coming and in a dispatch sent to the New York Times on November 26th, he said, whatever power there is, it is concentrated in the hands of the Soviets. And the influence of the Bolsheviks has increased enormously, but most correspondents and most newspaper editors refused to take the Bolsheviks seriously. By mid-September, Wilton felt sufficiently confident that nothing earth-shaking was about to happen that he left for London, thus completely missing the revolution and leaving the Times without anyone at all in Russia for the next 22 years. Of course, events in events very earth-shaking indeed were occurring. Lenin had returned from hiding in Finland. Kerensky had declared a state of emergency, declared illegal the Soviet Military Revolutionary Committee. 
ordered the arrest of Trotsky and other Bolshevik revolutionaries and banned Bolshevik newspapers. In Petrograd, Bolsheviks seized the railway stations, the state bank power station, the bridges across the river, and the telephone exchange, all without serious resistance. Military reinforcements sent for by Kerensky had not shown up, and he left Petrograd to try to rally the 3rd Cavalry Corps. During his absence, he lost the city. Trotsky's Military Revolutionary Committee announced that the government had fallen and that power had passed to the committee itself. Winter Palace, where Kerensky's ministers were sheltering, was stormed, and Trotsky telegraphed from the front that Kerensky, who had raided a small, who had rallied a small force of Cossacks, had been decisively repulsed. When the government's forces and the Kremlin surrendered, it was virtually all over. The Bolsheviks were in power. Few correspondents witnessed these momentous events, and even fewer understood enough of what was happening to appreciate their significance. High among these few stand the American journalist and poet John Reed, correspondent for The Masses, a radical liberal publication in the United States, who had been in Petrograd since August, and Morgan Phillips Price, the Manchester Guardian's correspondent. Reed later became a founding member of the Communist Party of America, and his sympathies from the beginning were with the Bolsheviks, but he saw the revolution with the clear eyes of a good and conscientious reporter, and his description of the events in Petrograd in November 1917 is unequaled. Reed, Phillips Price, and Arthur Ransom of the London Daily News were the only Western correspondents allowed into the Bolshevik headquarters in the Smolny Institute, a girls' school. Reed describes the historic meeting of the Second Congress of Soviets as Lenin's turn came to speak. Now Lenin, gripping the edge of the reading stand, let his little winking eyes travel over the crowd as he stood there waiting, apparently oblivious to the long rolling ovation, which lasted several minutes. When it finished, he said simply, We shall now proceed to construct the socialist order. Again, the overwhelming roar. The Congress later voted on Lenin's motion to end the war. If the German proletariat realizes that we are ready to consider all offers of peace, that will perhaps be the last drop which overflows the bowl. Revolution will break out in Germany. The motion was carried unanimously. Reed writes, Suddenly, by common impulse, we found ourselves on our feet, mumbling together into the smooth, lifting unison of the Internationale. A grizzled old soldier was sobbing like a child. The immense sound rolled through the hall, burst windows and doors, and soared into the quiet sky. The war is ended! The war is ended! said the young workman near me his face shining, and when it was over, as we stood there in a kind of awkward hush, someone in the back of the room shouted, Comrades, let us remember who have died for liberty. So we began to sing the funeral march, that slow, melancholy, and yet triumphant chant, so Russian and so moving, the funeral march seemed the very soul of those dark masses whose delegates sat in this hall, building from their obscure visions a new Russia, and perhaps more. How much of all this could newspaper readers in the rest of the world have learned at the time? The Times Petrograd correspondent was in London, so the Times had to report the revolution by courtesy of Reuters as did the British newspapers, but the Reuters correspondent in Petrograd, Guy Berenger, was, like any other news agency man, operating under great difficulty, and he fled to Finland as soon as he could.
His dispatches showed that he failed to understand what was happening. On the day the Bolsheviks took power, he reported that naval troops under maximalist orders had seized a few important points, but street traffic and the general life of the city remained normal. The Associated Press's bureau chief, Charles Smith, was knocked out by a soldier swinging a rifle butt, and another AP reporter was shot in the knees by a sniper. Robert Liddell abandoned journalism and instead proposed to the mili British military attaché a scheme to persuade a crack Russian regiment to fight against the Bolsheviks. The attaché lost interest when Liddell said he would need about a million pounds and gold for bribes. Liddell then made his way back for London. Reed and Phillips Price were the only correspondents to describe what, was hap what had happened. Reed cabled a short statement from Lennon, from Lennon on November 15th and a long story on the revolution in the New York call on November 21st. But it was Phillips Price, using the Danish Telegraph Agency, who sent to the Manchester Guardian the first account of the Bolshevik seizure of power. The government of Kerensky fell before the Bolshevik insurgents because it had no supporters in the country. The bourgeois parties and their generals and the staff disliked it because it would not establish a military dictatorship. The revolutionary democracy lost faith in it because... After eight months, it had neither given the land to the peasants, nor established state control of industries, nor advanced the cause of the Russian peace program. Instead, it brought off the July advance without any guarantee that the Allies had agreed to reconsider war aims. The Bolsheviks thus acquired great support all over the country. Bolshevik revolution may have taken newspapers by surprise, but they recovered quickly. Since they lacked the knowledge that Reed, Phillips Price, and Ransom had acquired, they were able to state categorically that the Bolsheviks would not survive. This, and abuse of the Bolshevik leaders, was the theme of all the dispatches and comment the following days. David Soskisi, the man in the Manchester Guardian, had sent to check on Philip's accuracy, had fled from the Winter Palace across the frontier to Finland. The Guardian ran his dispatches, even though they directly contradicted those from his colleague. The Bolsheviks must fall, Soskizi wrote from Oslo in November 1924. The Times, as early as November 12th, had Lenin losing control. The observer was certainly uh, was certain that Bolshevism would soon perish, and the Daily News felt that all Bolsheviks were doomed, thus ignoring the opinion of its man on the spot, Arthur Ransom, one of the few voices of accuracy and reason in the hysteria, who wrote. It is to deny actual fact that the Bolsheviks do hold a majority of the politically active population. The newspaper reader in the United States, like his counterpart in Britain, could have been forgiven for believing that it was only a matter of days before the Bolsheviks were overthrown. The insistent theme of Russian news in the New York Times was that the Bolsheviks could last for only a moment. In the next two years, this belief was faithfully fostered. Four times, Lenin and Trotsky were planning flight. Three times, they had already fled. Twice, Lenin was planning retirement. Once, he had been killed. And three times, he was in prison. One of the main reasons for Grossman information that those reports spread was a growing apprehension to the nature of Bolshe Bolshevism which encouraged wishful thinking about its early demise, as details of which uh, of Lenin's new social order filtered through to the West, the first signs appeared of the strong anti-Bolshevik sentiment that was soon to become fanatical.
It was bad enough for the landed gentry of Britain and France that the Bolsheviks had overthrown their betters in Russia. It was terrifying that they now spoke of spreading this appalling political dogma throughout Europe and perhaps the rest of the world. So when the delegates at the Soviet Congress spoke of the coming world revolution of which we are the advance guard, the Times responded with an editorial saying, the remedy for Bolshevism is bullets. And the Times reporters or readers began to regard the Bolsheviks as a gang of murderers, thieves, and blasphemers whom it was almost a sacred duty to destroy as the vermin. This was confirmed by the Russian release of all the secret treaties negotiated between the Tsarist regime and the Allies. Phillips Price scooped the world here by calling on Trotsky and asking if he could print the treaties in The Guardian. Trotsky could not see Phillips Price, but sent his secretary out with a bundle of documents and a message that he could borrow them overnight. A quick look convinced Phillips Price that he had the original treaties and that they were political dynamite. There was an agreement giving France a free hand in Western Europe on condition that Russia had a similar free hand in Poland. There was a similar there were a cynical bribe for Romania if she would enter the war by the offer of the Banat in, with its Yugoslavs, the Bukovina with its Ukrainian population, and Transylvania with its Magyars. There was the agreement splitting Persia between Britain and Russia. And finally, there was the infamous sykes picot Agreement dividing much of the Arab world among the Allies. The release of the latter agreement caused, caused Britain great embarrassment since she had already promised the Arabs independence in return for returning, for raising the Arab revolt. T. E. Lawrence had to try to explain to the Arabs why the British had double-crossed them. Phillips Price translated the documents working through the night, and then telegraphed them in four or five dispatches to the Manchester Guardian, in which they were published in some detail at the end of November. Compare the Guardian's treatment of what was without a doubt a major story with the attitude of the Times. The Times received a summary of the treatises from J.D. Boucher and Bel its Balkans man, who had stopped in Petrograd on his way to Japan. It published the summary, but made the amazing decision not to inconvenience the British, French, and Italian governments and to maintain silence about the secret treaties. Also, as far as possible, to curtail Petrograd correspondence dispatches on the subject, as the governments themselves were bound by the treaties to be silent the Times decided it could only follow their example. The reason of the treaties added the growing mistrust of the Allies felt towards the Bolsheviks, but much could have been forgiven if Russia had been willing to continue the fight against the Germans. In midwinter of 1917 to 1918, this became the dominant question in dispatches from Russia and in interviews with Russian experts in the West. The first f firm indication came from the Times man, Borchier, about, but his office ruined a first-class scoop. On November 22nd, to beat the censor, Borchier wrote a coded telegram to the Times through the British Embassy and signed it with the name of the ambassador, Sir George Buchanan. The telegram reached the Times two days later. It read, Our telegrams arriving sent about 4,500 4, words yesterday. Stop. Government instructed Commander Chief arrange armistice all fronts. The Times sat on the message for six days and apparently unable to believe it was true until the German radio carried the Chancellor's announcement to the Reichstag that peace negotiations with the Russians were well underway. Even now, the Allies refused to lose hope that Russia might still fight on,
Dispatches sounded a friendly, optimistic tone. The New York Times going so far as to say in one headline, Bolsheviki may help allies best. And even correspondents, who had seen for themselves the war weariness of the Russians, patriotically wrote that the war for Germany might indeed continue. This hope vanished abruptly on February 12, 1918, when the Soviet government announced that as far as it was concerned, the war was over. Immediately, a new period began, the preparation of public opinion for Allied intervention. The papers were loud in their condemnation of Russia's treachery, and leaving the Allies faced with Germany freed from Russian pressure on the Eastern Front, Russians sell out to the Germans, and Bolsheviki Russia's riches to Berlin were typical headlines in the New York Times. Russia yielded to Germany 34% 30 of her population, 32% of her agricultural land, 54% of her industry, and 89% of her coal mines. So intervention was justified at the beginning on the grounds of the German peril. It did not originate in the hostility to the social aims of Bolshevism, said the History of the Times in 1951. This was not entirely true. Lenin's revolutionary decrees were still being announced when the British Secret Intelligence Service, SIS, sent its first agents into Russia with the express aim of overthrowing the Bolsheviks. They were involved in an abortive attempt to assassinate Lenin. On August 31st, 1918, a social revolutionary named Dora Copeland shot Lenin twice. The plot envisaged his assassination should coincide with risings in Moscow and Petrograd organized by notorious British spy Sidney Riley. Riley was late and Dora Copeland shot too soon, but Lenin nearly died. <clears throat> okay. And there was soon an existence in SIS dining circle called Bolo for Bolshevik, Liquidation Club, so it is clear that at least one section of the Allies was determined to achieve what Churchill said later would have been a blessing to the human race, the strangling of Bolshevism at birth. Two correspondents, Philip Price and Ransom, saw the other side of the picture and did their best to inform the British public. British Price pointed out that a Russia benevolently neutral to the West but bitterly hostile to Prussia would force Germany to keep more troops in the East. Ransom, like many foreign correspondents in those days, especially the Timesmen, had some connection with the SIS, but had decided he could not in all conscious, conscience continue it. He now tried to explain to his readers that the Allies' attitude only encouraged the Bolsheviks to believe that Allies planned to buy off Germany by encouraging her in Russia. A fear only too justified Phillips Price and Ransom felt so strongly that the Allies were mishandling the situation that they got together with Colonel Raymond Robbins, head of the American Red Cross in Russia and a personal representative of President Wilson, and sent off messages expressing the view that the Bolsheviks were bound to resist the German generals in the long run, however impotent they might be at the moment. Scott backed them in the Manchester Guardian. It was no use. The Allies were expecting massive German offensive. It materialized in March and were in no mood to go to see beyond the fact that the Bolsheviks had made peace with Germany. Indeed, the Allies reasoned the Bolsheviks were probably German agents working for the Kaiser. Preparations for intervention went ahead. The Allies were encouraged to believe from earlier reports of correspondents like Wilton of the Times that all of Russia would rise to meet them. From Lake Baikal to the Drista, from the Don to the Persian border, wrote Wilton in 1917, 
loyal sons of Russia are ready to rise against the forces of disintegration and defeat. The French, too, who had been thinking of intervention in 1917. General Folk, an inter in an interview with New York Times, said, Germany is walking through Russia. America and Japan, who are in a position to do so, should go to meet her in Siberia. The stage was thus set for what was perhaps the greatest act of folly the Allies committed in the First World War, an act that poisoned relations with Russia all the way through the time of writing. We will remember, Nikita Khrushchev said in Los Angeles, 1959, the grim days when all the countries of Europe and America marched on our country to strangle the new revolution. The only Western correspondent to report the intervention from the, West, from the Russian side was Phillips Price, who had remained in Petrograd in desperate circumstances. Reed had joined a Soviet propaganda bureau, and Ransom returned to Britain in April 1918. The Guardian could not send me any money. The Guardian could not send me any money, he said some years later, because the banks had been closed to prevent any cash reaching counter revolutionaries. I had to live on one eighth of a pound of bread a day, potato skins, and tea. I lost twenty pounds in three weeks. As well, there was the risk that if the Bolsheviks were overthrown, then I would be shot. I weighed the chances. I decided I was in the middle of perhaps the biggest thing that had happened to the world and that it was worth risking my life to stay on. He was down to 112 pounds when the arrival in Petrograd of G. V. Chicherin, a Bolshevik leader, later commissar of the foreign affairs, uh, who had been in exile in Britain, saved him. Chicherin had been the had been to Lenin and said that there are only fair and objective reports of Russia appearing in the West were those of Phillips Price and Ransom and where he could find where could he find them? He was horrified at Phillips Price's condition and made immediate arrangements for him to be allowed money from London. The fact that the burden of providing the bulk of the news from the Bolshevik Russia fell on one correspondent who was freely who freely admitted that disgust with British censorship and the short-sightedness of British policy made him eventually abandon his objectivity is of even greater significance when the correspondence with the interventionist forces are scrutinized. The Times, without a man in Russia, had to get by as best it could, which was poorly. Hardly any of the reforms introduced by the Bolsheviks were reported with the significant exception of measures affecting banks and banking. Nothing was reported of any projects of socialization, nothing of the nationalization of the land, nothing even of the reform of the calendar, which took place in February 1918, and so ended the confusion between old-style and nude-style dating. The dark silence maintained by the times was broken only occasionally by the publication of a letter from some, some such dubious source as a correspondent in Petrograd with an unusual opportunity for assessing the situation. Looking back in 1951, the Times had the grace to admit how poor their coverage had been. It was hardly guessed that there was nothing 99 out of every 100 Russians wanted except peace, Still less if it was appreciated that the one thing that might induce Russia to remain in arms was foreign intervention. The fundamental British error was that belief that local forces could be raised in opposition to the Bolshevik regime. The Times perhaps bears the responsibility of having failed to provide a correspondence from the Bolshevik Russia which could have convinced the government of this error. So Britain... France, Japan, and the United States, the latter reluctantly committed themselves 
to the intervention in Russia, and before it was over, must have seemed to the Russians that half the world was against them. The intervention can be divided into two parts. That before the armistice was signed with Germany on November 11th, 1918, and that which carried on after the war was over. The first period, which began with a token landing of British and Japanese troops with Vladivostok in April 1918, received scant coverage in the Allied press because of censorship in preoccupation with the Western Front. On March 21, 1918, the Germans had launched a massive offensive in France, overwhelming the British Army. Hegg's Backs to the Wall Order of the Day had been published on April 13th, and the great battle in France and in Flanders monopolized space in the newspapers in Britain. The situation was so serious that a plan was discussed to end the war, as Trotsky had feared, by giving the Germans a free hand in Russia. The Prime Minister, Lloyd George, and various ministers and ex-ministers, including members of the War Cabinet and some members of the Labour Party, met privately to discuss such a scheme. Nothing came of it, but it showed that the Bolsheviks' fears about Allied intentions were not unfounded, and their suspicions grew. Phillips Price has confirmed the suspiciousness toward the Allies. He, too, began to feel it, because nearly everything he wrote in the Russian view of events was killed by the British censor. He sent a dispatch reporting a revolt throughout the country by the left socialist revolutionaries and the anarchists, explaining how suppressed how it was suppressed, and quoting Lenin, the left SAs have committed political suicide by striking against revolutionary real politic. Henceforth, we, Bolsheviks, must bear the sole burden of the revolution. This was a dispatch of some historic importance, realizing or revealing the sweeping away of debris of the past that had still remained inside the Russian revolutionary movement, and confirming the Bolsheviks in power. The British censor suppressed it. On June 6th, he telegraphed to the Manchester Guardian a statement by the Bolsheviks on the efforts they were making to return to the Allies, a Czech army that had been fighting for the Germans, that had been fighting the Germans on the Eastern Front, and the agents who... Uh, and on the obstructions that were being put in the way of this plan by French agents, who, the statement said, were trying to turn the Czechs against the Bolsheviks. The censor in Britain, Frank Swettenham, stopped the telegram and ordered the Guardian not to publish it. Phillips Price wrote an article of his own, pointing out that when the Czechs marched into a Russian town, they arrested the local Soviet and set up in authority relying on cadets and Cossack officers. Since they were acting under the protection of the French military mission and were unofficial representatives of the Allies, the Allies could not sanctimoniously pretend that they are not intervening in Russia's internal affairs and are not helping one of the two political forces in the country against one another. The messages by some chance escaped the censor, and the Guardian's editor, Scott, after reading it, telegraphed Phillips Price, asking him to find out whether the Bolshevik government would enter in, into economic relations with Britain. Phillips Price interviewed the Commissar for Foreign Affairs, Chicherin, and reported his request for agricultural implements and machinery for 